Now, uh, yes, this, the, the, these are video lectures for organic chemistry for JE, IDJ. We have already completed concepts on inductive effect and hyperconjugation, and we are at the stage to start with one of the most important effect that operates in organic. One of the most important pillar on which the organic is laid on, that is resonance. But before starting resonance, I feel like talking about hybridization a bit, so that we can understand resonance in greater depth. Hybridization uh, is uh, something you must have studied in chemical bonding, but I do feel the need to talk about it right here. Hybridization, uh, before giving you the definition of hybridization, let's talk about the shape of P orbital. P orbital, as you must be knowing, and in case you don't know, then know from now. P orbital is of dumbbell shaped. This dumbbell shaped, this is the dumbbell shape. Now, this dumbbell shape uh, has two lobes. These are the two lobes. Upper lobe and lower lobe. This is the shape of a P orbital. Each orbital is potent to contain maximum of two electrons. So generally, when, uh, uh, when, when the atom is in atomic state, it does not make any bond, then electrons are in P orbital, and the P orbital has a dumbbell shape like this. When a sigma bond is formed, a sigma bond is formed by head-on overlapping. head on head on overlapping means head to head as if they are colliding or they are fighting head to head this is called head on overlapping overlapping means a region that will be common to both the orbital and this is a region that is common to both the orbital. This is a region of overlapping. Now, uh, overlapping. Now, now uh, before proceeding ahead, let me give you a slight idea of what a bond is. A bond is nothing but attraction of uh, electronic of electronic density by two, ne uh, two nucleuses. When these two atoms were far away, then electron in this orbital was attracted only by the nucleus of this atom. An electron in this orbital is attracted only by the nucleus of this atom. Now this electron is attracted with the nucleus of this atom, these electrons were attracted with the nucleus of these atoms. When they come together, when they come close, they start to overlap. That means the electron of orbital A, let me name it as A and B, the electron of orbital A comes into the region in which the orbital B exists. That means some electronic density of orbital A is attracted also by the nucleus of orbital B. Similarly, some electronic density of orbital B is also attracted by the nucleus of atom A or orbital A. That means the electronic density which is in this region, this electronic density is attracted by both the nucleuses. So if this electronic density is moved, suppose I move this uh, forward, then both the nucleus will come along with this electronic density because both the nucleus is attracted by this electronic density. That means wherever they go, they'll go together and hence a bond will be formed. If you break it and both the atoms move, uh, move independent of each other, then the bond will be broken. A bond between two atoms exists because of attraction of electronic density by the two nucleuses and those electronic densities are the one which is common to both the regions. That means they are in the overlapping region. So the strength of the bond is decided only by the electronic density which is inside the overlapping region. The electron which is in this region, this is attracted only by the nucleus of orbital B. The electron which is in this region is attracted only by the nucleus of orbital A. But the electron which is in this overlapping region is attracted by the nucleus of both the atom and that is responsible for the strength of the bond. Now let's see, if a sigma bond is formed, now as you can see in the, the electronic density responsible for the strength of the bond are only those which are in facing lobes. These are facing lobes and these are non-facing lobes. The electronic density which is in non-facing lobes has nothing to do with the bond strength of bond, bond strength between these two atoms. 
The electrons which are in non-facing lobes are not attracted by both the nucleuses. Only those electrons which are in the facing lobes are attracted by both the nucleuses. So the idea behind it is that non-facing lobes must be small uh, or as small as possible and these facing lobes must be enlarged so that they can accommodate more number of electronic density, more amount of electronic density and hence the bond strength is increased. So what happens is, uh, imagine this to be made up of balloons, like uh, a P orbital is made up of two balloons, one of the balloon is for uh, facing lobe, one of the balloon is for non-facing lobe. And imagine as if you are squeezing this non-facing lobe, if you squeeze this balloon, then this balloon will become broad and enlarged, because the air from this balloon will get into the, will get into this balloon. So imagine it to be made up of balloons and you are squeezing this balloon so that the, all of the air from this balloon is coming over to this balloon and this will become enlarged and broadened. So if I squeeze the non-facing lobe, it will become small and in turn the facing lobe will become enlarged and broader. Similarly, I squeeze the non-facing lobe for the second orbital and this also becomes smaller and the facing lobe becomes larger and broader. Now, this, due to this broadness, the overlapping region will become greater than the overlapping region here. And if the overlapping region is greater, that means more amount of electronic density exists in overlapping region. That means attraction by the nucleuses for these electronic densities will increase. If the attraction increases, then these two nucleuses are held together by a stronger force. That means the bond is strong. Now this happens spontaneously. This happens all by itself. And this phenomenon is called hybridization. A change in the shape of P orbital from a symmetrical one to a non-symmetrical one which one of the lobe as a small and the other lobe enlarged and broader. This process is called hybridization. This process happens to strengthen the strength of the sigma bond. There are other situations also in which hybridization occurs and those are as we will see here. Now suppose you have two electrons, suppose you have two electrons in a bond, suppose you are, we are talking about ammonia. Now in ammonia nitrogen has a lone pair. Nitrogen has a lone pair that means when one of the orbital nitrogen has two electrons. Now these two electrons has to be accommodated in a single orbital. Now I am giving you two situations in which in the first case the orbital, the, the two electrons are in a pure P orbital. This is a pure P orbital and this is a hybridized orbital. Now if I, if I ask you, uh, in which orbital would you like to keep your lone pair in a pure P orbital or a hybridized orbital? Now the lone pair uh, will the lone pair has two electrons and th those two electrons have inter-electronic repulsion. We always try to minimize the repulsive force because repulsive force causes instability and we always try to maximize the attractive force. Attractive force creates stability. This is a, this is a, this is a natural thing to do. We minimize the repulsive force and we maximize the attractive force. So these two electrons, the repulsive force between these two electrons has to be minimized and that can be done if we take, keep these electrons as far as possible. Now, in hybridized orbital, the room available, the space available for the electron to be accommodated is larger. That means these two electrons can be kept far away from each other. That scope is there in a hybridized orbital. So whenever you have two electrons kept in a same orbital, those two electrons remain in a hybridized orbital so that more room is available, so that the space between two electrons is larger, so that the force of repulsion between two electrons is lesser so that the stability is more. So the first thing we saw, if we are making a sigma bond, sigma bond is formed by hybridized orbitals so that the region of overlapping is greater. The second thing we are seeing, if you have a lone pair, that lone pair must reside in a hybridized orbital because the room available for the hybridized, in the hybridized orbital is more, so that the space between the electrons are greater, so that the repulsive force is less, and so that the attractive uh, uh, stability is more. Now the, let, let's, let's see a third case. In a third case, we are talking about a free radical. You know, species having one pair, one, uh, one unpaired electron is called a radical, like CS3 dot. This is a methyl radical. 
It is also called as free radical because this, these radicals are free. Free for reaction. Uh, they are free for reaction because the activation energy for their reactions is zero. And what is this activation energy? We'll see later in the course. Half in half, they are called as free radical. Now if we have to keep only free radical means one electron. So that means that in the orbital you will be having only one electron. So if you are having only one electron, would you like to keep it in a hybridized orbital or unhybridized orbital? This is hybridized orbital, this is unhybridized or pure P. Now if we have only one electron, there is no repulsive force as was in the case of lone pair. So we would not unnecessarily hybridize the orbital because hybridization takes energy hybridization energy. So to hybridize the orbital we have to give an hybridization energy. So we will not hybridize the orbital if you have only one electron in the orbital because we unnecessarily don't spend hybridization energy. So if we have in case of a free radical if we have only one electron in the orbital that remains in a pure p orbital. We don't go for hybridization when you have one electron. When you have two electrons, you go for hybridization. You don't keep it in a pure orbital. Now let's move ahead. Let's talk about negative charge. Let's talk about methyl anion. Now this anion was how this anion was formed. Let, let, let's, let's suppose this methyl group was bonded to an atom A and when this bond was broken, both the electrons in this bond was given to this carbon. So a negative charge was developed on methyl anion. Now how this is formed, this is not an issue. We'll see later on how this methyl anion is formed. But somehow we have methyl anion. An ion means a, an electron has come from an outer source. This, this bond has two electrons. One of the electrons was of carbon, the other one was of A. While breaking the bond, we gave both the electrons to the carbon of this methyl group. Hence this carbon has two electrons. One of the electron is its own, the other electron is from outer source. For that, the electron from the outer source, one, one negative charge is developed. But this carbon indeed has two electrons in the orbital. One of its, one of the electron is its own, the other one is from the outer source. Now this you have to keep in mind, this you have to know for the rest of the course that an ion has two electrons. One of the electron is from the outer source, that's why it has minus one charge and the other electron is of its own but an anion has two electrons in the orbital. So if you have two electrons in the orbital, that is the same case as uh, the lone pair. Lone pair also have two electrons, but in lone pair both the electrons plus the atom's own electron. So in a negative charge, you, indeed you have two electrons. So a negative charge is as good as a lone pair in terms of number of electrons. So in negative charge also, we we'll like to keep the, both the electrons in hybridized orbital so that more room is available for the electron to stay in so that the inter-electronic repulsion is as less as possible, so that the stability is more. Now the only thing left here is, suppose we are talking about cation. Suppose we have methyl uh, cation. Then uh, a cation is formed, uh, suppose uh, we had a bond between methyl group and chlorine, and while going away, when we broke this bond somehow by providing heat or by providing radiations, whatever, I break this bond. When I break this bond by going chlorine, chlorine took away both the electron of this bond. So chlorine came out as Cl minus, as chloride ion. And the electron, the one electron which is of methyl group, that too was taken away by chlorine. So this methyl group is devoid of one electron. So a plus charge is generated on this carbon. A carbocation is generated. Now before this bond was formed, carbon had one electron. Chlorine had one electron. When this bond was formed, overlapping occurred. Now both the electrons belong to both the atom. While going away, chlorine took both the electrons. And the orbital of carbon was hence emptied up. Now the bottom line of this discussion is, plus charge signifies empty orbital. Now this has to be engraved deep into your mind as deep as possible. You have to know uh, if an atom has plus charge, that means the orbital of that atom was empty. Previously it was having one electron. You have went for forming the bond. By going away, both the electrons was taken away by one atom. So the other atom is devoid of its electron. That's why plus charge is generated on this. Because the number of protons hasn't been decreased in the nucleus and the number of electrons has decreased. That's why plus charge means empty orbital. Minus charge means completely filled orbital. These two things has to be understood very, very well.